Hello, everybody. This is Allie Orwig with the Indiana Rural Health Association. We want to thank you for joining us today for today's Lunch and Learn, Cervical Cancer and the HPV Vaccine. Uh, we've got Mary Robertson with us from the IU Simon Cancer Center today. Great presentation. We're really looking forward to it. I uh, just wanted to remind everybody we are recording today's session, so it will be available on our YouTube channel by the end of the week. If you do have questions, please hold those to the end, and otherwise, we will keep an eye on the chat during the presentation. Uh, the chat function is at the bottom of the screen. You can also use the Q&A function, uh, very, very similar to the chat function. You can find that at the bottom of the screen as well. Without further ado, Mary, I will go ahead and turn it over to you for today's presentation. Thanks so much, Allie. Really excited to be here and raise more awareness for cervical cancer and the HPV vaccine. So, All right, my slides will cooperate. There we go. So just a quick overview about what we'll be covering today. Um, it'll be really going over the basics about cervical cancer, a little bit of data comparing Indiana to the U.S., looking at uh, some disparities as well as risk factors and prevention, one of those being the HPV vaccine with an eye on rural health, uh, getting into screening for cervical cancer, and then looking at effects of childhood health and some local resources. So what is cervical cancer? Uh, the cervix is part of the female reproductive system, and cervical cancer is that abnormal growth of the cells on the cervix or an abnormal of growth of cells that begin in the cervix. So the cells do not suddenly change into cancer. Instead, normal cells of the cervix first um, appear and then gradually develop to abnormal changes that we call uh, precancer, which we'll discuss more on the next slide. Um, but I do like to point out it is the only preventable gynecological cancer um, and that's uh, really important as, to keep in mind as we go through this presentation. Just a couple terms that I think are important to note um, that you may be talking about with your patients or here in the community. Um, uh, so the first one being dysplasia, which is really that abnormal cells um, that have the potential to turn into cancer. So they are not cancer yet but that's what we call those precancerous cells. Um, and they can be staged as well, so mild, moderate, or severe. And then those more severe dysplasia have a higher risk of turning into cancer uh, over time. And then cancer, as you've heard, has many different stages. Uh, and stage one is when those cells have um, turned into cancer and then gone and spread beyond um, the, ba the basement membrane and are confined to a local area. And then there are further, further stages of cervical cancer, as I'm sure you are familiar with. So getting in uh, to data a little bit in Indiana, looking at incidence and mortality. Incidence are those number of new cases and mortality of our number of deaths due to the disease. So according to American Cancer Society, for 2023, uh, they predict that there's going to be 280 new cases of cervical cancer in Indiana as well as 88 deaths, um, average of 88 deaths annually in Indiana. The number of deaths in cervical cancer in the US and Indiana have decreased substantially, and that's really due to the implementation of widespread screening and uh, HPV vaccination. So females are most often diagnosed with cervical cancer during their middle adult years, most commonly ages 35 to 44. Um, but obviously any female can get cervical cancer and about more than 20% of cases are found in women ages 65 and older. Taking a look at some disparities, which we know exist across uh, all health conditions, chronic health conditions, and especially cancer, taking a look at specifically Indiana as well from the years 2015 to 2019, we're seeing that Hispanic females have a higher incidence rate, so that is those new cases of cervical cancer compared to white and African-American females. So the age-adjusted rate per 100,000 for Hispanic females is 12.2 compared to white, which is 8.4, and black, which is 8.2. And then we are also seeing uh, 
difference in mortality, so deaths due to cervical cancer as well, with African Americans having a higher rate as well compared to Hispanics and females. And so um, looking at that mortality, mortality rate, African Americans have a 3.5 per 100,000 population compared to Hispanic 3.1 and white 2.6 in Indiana. And I just mentioned, we're seeing that women uh, between the ages of 35 and 44 are being diagnosed at a higher rate, as well as we're seeing um, disparities in geographical regions as well. So looking at urban versus rural, we're seeing that rural residents have lower screening and vaccination rates. Comparing Indiana to the U.S., I'm sure this will be a surprise to no one as we rank almost last or close to last in most of our health rankings. Um, but what we are seeing is that in, um, from 1999 to 2017, Indiana's incidence rate new cases of cervical cancer were 1.2% higher than the U.S. average, and our mortality rates were also 4.1% higher. So um, we know we really have a lot of work to do here. When it comes to risk factors for cervical cancer, the greatest risk factor is HPV infection, which is the human papillomavirus, which we'll get into more details. But that is really estimated about 91% of cervical cancer cases are caused by the HPV infection um, per year, and that's for um, the CDC. Other con uh, risk factors include contracting the HIV virus um, or other immune um, uh, uh, diseases that are from a compromised immune system. If you're using tobacco, um, often people think about lung cancer and that direct link, but however, tobacco use actually uh, is linked to 13 different types of cancer, including cervical cancer. Um, using birth controls over a long period of time, having given birth to multiple children, and having several sexual partners. Um, so, even though all women are at risk for cervical cancer, those with long-lasting HPV infection um, is, is the main cause of cervical cancer, as I mentioned at that 91%. So prevention is key. Prevention, risk reduction, as we know, the more we can do to prevent a disease from occurring, um, the better off you are, the easier we can treat it, um, and often uh, cheaper it is as well. So as I mentioned, cervical cancer is almost 100% preventable through regular screenings, avoiding those uh, risk factors that I just mentioned in the last slide and HPV vaccination. So having routine cervical cancer screening, either with a pap smear or HPV testing, is really, really critical. And making those recommendations to our patients is really critical as well. Um, but other actions we can take take to help reduce our risk, as I mentioned, practicing safe sex, so limiting partners or using condoms, avoiding that tobacco use, and watching for any abnormal changes in your health, your discharge, your bleeding. You know your body best, so it, it's, it's really important that you have any unusual symptoms that you talk to your provider about that. And again, having the HPV testing along with uh, pap smear testing after age 30. So HPV vaccination is cancer prevention. It is the only cancer prevention vaccine we have. So we really like to tout it as that. Um, so making sure we're sharing that with our community, our patients, our colleagues, our friends and family is really important because uh, word of mouth goes a long way. So HPV stands for the human papilloma virus. Uh, it is extremely, extremely common. According to the CDC, 42 million Americans are currently infected. Uh, and then again, another 13 million are going to become infected each year. So the virus is really common and certain strains of it can cause cancer later in life. And as I said, it's extremely common. About 85% of people get HPV infection in their lifetime. It is spread through intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact. And many folks, um, as I said, because it's so common, have HPV um, and don't realize it because it doesn't have uh, many signs or symptoms. In addition to that, most HPV infections, about uh, about nine out of 10, they do go away with by themselves within two years. So your system, your immune system clears the virus, 
but sometimes those infections will last longer and cause cancers later in life. Um, and so every year in the U.S., HPV causes about 36,000 cases of cancer in men and women. And so this graph um, or chart image, whatever you want to call it, um, shows the different types of cancers that uh, HPV can lead to in both men and women. So I know when we're talking about cervical cancer, our focus is on women, but the HPV infection can also cause cancer in men, which we'll get into more details in a little bit, which is on the rise. So the six cancers include cervical, which we're talking about today, anal cancer, vulvar cancer, cancer, oral cancer, penile cancer, and vaginal cancer. And I like to point out that um, oral pharyngeal cancer includes um, your tongue, your tonsils as well, and the base of the throat. So again, um, what is the HPV vaccine? Um, I know there's a lot of questions about this, especially um, since we've had COVID and the COVID vaccine, which is a great time to talk about science. Um, and so I just wanted to get into a little bit that HPV vaccines are extremely safe. Um, I think to date there's been over 50 studies that show the long-term safety um, indicate a high degree of safety. Um, of course, like any other vaccine, you're going to have some short-term symptoms like local redness, you know, or swelling uh, at the vaccination site, which is to be expected. Um, but what we are seeing is that HPV vaccines are highly effective in reducing the infection um, and, and the disease caused by HPV types represented in the vaccine. So the current vaccine is what is referred to as the nine-valent vaccine. Often you'll hear uh, Gardasil 9, uh, as what it's referred to, it does protect the, against the HPV types listed. So uh, 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. And some of those uh, can lead to cancer in later in life. Others um, can lead to other diseases such as genital warts. So the vaccine not only protects against cancer, but other diseases like genital warts. So um, great to note that as well. Looking at vaccine uh, uptake as a whole and how we're doing in the U.S., especially compared to other countries, um, we have a modest uptake about average about 60% across the country. However, um, we do have the lowest HPV vaccination rates and in the populations that have the highest rates of cervical cancer. So um, Considering the link I just mentioned <clears throat> and have been talking about, that that definitely makes sense. Um, but one thing is to know about what can we do about that if our uptake is low? What are the reasons? What are the barriers? Um, what can we do? Is Studies are showing over and over again that acceptance of the vaccine, uptake of it, getting the full two doses really improves with a strong provider recommendation. Um, and I cannot emphasize that enough that um, that is the most trusted source, and so we'll get into what that what that means as well. Oops. Sorry, skipping around a little bit. Um, also, just want to know that note that the vaccine does have long lasting perfect, uh, protection, and there's no therapeutic benefit, so it does not treat HPV, and so that's why it's really crucial that the vaccine is given before exposure to HPV occurs. So I wanted to go I'll quickly go over the recommendations, um, and again, this is from uh, the ACIP Advisory Committee on Immuniz Immunization Practices, um, and so the a recommendation is that for children beginning at nine years old, the target area is from really nine to 12 um, to initiate the vaccine. And so that is for both male and females, and that will be at two doses. Um, and so everyone through the age 26 should get the HPV vaccine if they aren't fully vaccinated already. However, the, the HPV vaccination is not recommended for everyone older than 26. And that's really where it comes to shared decision making between the patient and your provider or practitioner. So um, some adults between the ages of 27 and 45 who aren't already vaccinated 
may choose to get the vaccine after speaking with a doctor about the risk for new HPV infections and, and the possible benefits um, of vaccinating. But HPV vaccination of adults provides less benefit because generally there have been a, a previous exposure, as I mentioned, because HPV is so common. Um, and so at this age um, of, of 27 plus, there are chances that um, they've already been exposed. So it's just really important to talk to your doctor. Um, as I mentioned, the HPV vaccine prevents infections, does not treat previous ones. Um, and so that's why it's important to get vaccine, get vaccinated and then have screening in combination with that. Um, and looking at our rates, so based on BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, in 2021, um, excuse me, this is actually from the, the Teen Immunization Survey. Uh, in 2021, our state rate for up-to-date vaccination for adolescents aged 13 to 17 was 55.2%. Our goal is 80%, so we have a long way to go. And of course, no surprise again, that is lower than the national average, uh, which is actually 61.7%. So um, pretty significant. So then I wanted to take a moment to talk about HPV-associated cancer inequities. Um, HPV-associated cancer, um, this is a study uh, in the Journal of Rural Health looking at trends by sex between 1995 and 2013. Um, and as you can see, these are some pretty startling numbers. Across the board, we're seeing that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, rural men and women have seen an increase um, in those associated cancers. But I really wanted to focus on rural men, a 90.9, <clears throat> excuse me, a 90.9% increase uh, is, is incredibly large. Uh, and then looking at that compared to our urban women who have seen a 16.8% decrease um, and our urban men who have seen a 46.2% increase. So some key takeaways from this study and, and from these statistics in general is that HPV-associated cancers are elevated in non-metropolitan areas. And the improvements that we have seen in cancer rates uh, for cervical cancer are much lower in non-metropolitan areas. And then uh, additionally, the acceleration of oral pharyngeal cancer. So this is really looking at some of those rural men, that 90.9% increase. A lot of that can be attributed to the rise in oral pharyngeal cancer. So again, being the, the mouth, uh, the base of the throat and tonsils. Um, here is uh, another great chart that I think really speaks to what is happening in rural versus suburban and urban areas. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we have lower uptake of the vaccine in rural areas. And uh, as you can see, the rates here with rural being in red. So uh, the, the first bar on the bars on the left, that is one dose of the HPV. And then the HPV up to date means they've completed the series. So depending on their age being that two or three doses. And additionally, from uh, 2013 to 2018, we've, we've seen trending that the magnitude of disparities uh, for those areas that are just getting that one dose coverage um, has, has not improved that much in rural areas. And then again, and from 2019 to 2021, there was slight improvement between urban and rural areas. So, um, we're seeing very, very gradual change. I mentioned before the importance of a strong recommendation, so I just wanted to show a little bit of data, um, re-emphasizing that and then talking about how do we close that gap. So looking at uh, the CDC National uh, Immunization Survey the team, this is from 2020, we saw that parents in urban areas were more likely than in rural areas to receive an HPV vaccine recommendation from their adolescence provider, so that the pro provider was even bringing it up and then recommending it. So you can see that difference, which you know contributes to why there is lower uptake. And then I wanted to show this uh, from the same source that not receiving a provider recommendation was listed as. Uh, 
the top reason parents choose uh, not to vaccinate for HPV. It's one at the top, along with safety uh, concerns and side effects. So how do we close that gap? Uh, we could talk all day about disparities and inequities um, across the board, but how do we make some of those changes? So we can implement these evidence-based strategies as shown in research to work. Um, however, the ones underlined are really important and critical to look at when we're talking about rural areas, school providers, rural um, hospitals and health centers. So increasing access, building that clinic capacity, and it's really important to treat every visit as a vaccination visit. We know that folks, um, especially children and their parents may come to their annual visit um, not every year or they may come sporadically. So anytime in the, that they're in the office is the opportunity to talk about cancer prevention um, and this vaccine. So making sure we um, have prompts or other systems that really allow us to, to keep have that culture. Um, and then making that effective recommendation. Again, as I said, research over and over shows the impact uh, that that can have. But in addition, like I said, this prompt, tracking series, completion and follow-up. So um, having, you know, this provider report cards and um, measuring and improving that performance. So we obviously wanna address um, any concerns or questions that parents have and work to increase that vaccine confidence. Uh, as well as uh, when we're in the community, when we're talking with our patients, we really want to be developing those communication strategies that are tailored to your community um, and talking points that really matter to them. So uh, making that strong recommendation and effective recommendation, um, it, one of those examples is using the sandwich method. So when you're with your um, your patients and, and their, uh, their parents or whoever they're um, family system is saying, oh, thanks for coming in today. You're due for your flu, your HPV, and your meningitis B vaccine. Do you have any questions for me? And so you're, you're adding in the vaccine right in there with all the other um, recommended ones at that time. You're not singling it out as being any different because all of those vaccines are going to be recommended for their age. So that's an example of how it's put in the mix, that it's normal, um, and 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 on time and on schedule to be recommended. So that's just one example. So again, I this is just a, a fun graphic, but it can be reversed as well. Talk to your doctor about getting cervical cancer screenings, HIV, talk to your patients about it, um, because we have seen the impact and improvement in health. Among teen girls, infections with HPV type that cause genital warts have dropped by 88%. Among adult women, um, infections with HPV that call, cause cancer and genital warts have dropped 81%. And then among vaccinated women, the percentage of cervical precancers caused by HPV linked to cervical cancer have dropped by over 40%. So um, it really can't be understated about the impact and importance of the vaccine. And at the population level, Vaccine uh, of children and adolescents is the most effective way to reduce the burden of HPV-associated cancers, including cervical cancer. So switching gears, pivoting back to cervical cancer, as we just talked about the HPV vaccine as a way to prevent cancer. Um, I've mentioned screening a few different times, but both the PAP and the HPV test um, may detect cervical cancer early. And the goal of, of cervical cancer screening is to find those pre-cancer or cancer early when it's going to be more treatable and more curable. As we said, um, some of those disparities that we've seen in mortality is due to uh, populations getting diagnosed uh, with the cancer at later stages, which means you, have, you potentially could have more limited treatment options. So again, that regular screening can prevent cancer and save lives. Um, so this is the recommendations that are on the screen for those that are ages 21 to 29 to start getting a pap test start at age 21 and continue every three years if you have a normal result. If you have an abnormal result, your doctor may recommend different screening time frames. For those that are ages 30 to 65, you're either going to want to be receiving or recommending a pap test every three years with a normal result. Uh, HP, 
HPV test every five years with a normal result or co-testing, having both done every five years with a normal result. So those precancerous changes can be detected by the pap test um, to prevent cancer from developing, whereas the HPV test looks for infection by high-risk types of HPV that are more likely to cause uh, precancers and cancers of the cervix. So again, HPV infection has no treatment, but the vaccine can help prevent it. Then we look at those that are over 65, um, and it may discontinue uh, screening. You may discontinue screening or recommending screening under certain circumstances. So if you have several near, uh, years of normal pap smear, I believe that's 15 plus prior service removal and some others, um, that's when you really talk to your doctor. Again, the importance of the shared decision making if continuing screening is right for you. And I wanted to touch on as well, um, while we're talking about screening, really the impact of COVID that we saw in cervical uh, cancer screenings, cancer screenings in general, a lot of healthcare while we were fo focused on um, on maintaining or uh, dealing with COVID. And just some statistics is that um, cancer, cervical cancer screenings dropped by 86% between January of 2020 and April of 2020 alone. So just looking at those few months and we know those uh, numbers extended. And then uh, the American Cancer Society has reported uh, that there was an estimated 94% drop in weekly cervical cancer screenings um, from March of 2017 to 2019. So over 2,500 missed or delayed diagnosis. And as we said, the earlier that you can catch the cancer or those precancerous cells, the more treatable and curable it is. So, we really want to make sure that we, um, when we're in living in this semi-post-COVID world, that when patients are coming back into the office, we are covering cancer screenings with all the other routine health, and that we are getting people back on track with their screenings. Um, and I can um, send a lot of resources that are helpful, talking points and uh, other resources for both uh, cervical cancer screening and HPV recommendations as well. Talking about some signs and symptoms um, for individuals to look out for or um, to discuss with our patients. Um, so symptoms of early cervical cancer, they usually don't exist, um, which makes it really hard to detect, which is why, again, we emphasize screening that can detect earlier precancer stages. Um, and if you are having symptoms, it's mo most likely the cancer has already spread. So um, when the symptoms of early stage cancer do occur, they might be some vaginal bleeding after sex or after menopause, bleeding between periods um, or periods that are heavier or, or longer than normal, and then also having discharge that is different, watery, has strong odor, or may contain blood, um, and additionally looking at pelvic pain or pain during sex. The symptoms of advanced cervical cancer so those that have spread beyond the cervix to other parts of the body may include some of those symptoms that I just mentioned, but also may include difficult or painful bowel movement, bleeding from the rectum when having a bowel movement, um, a difficult or painful urination um, or blood in the urine, in addition to potentially fall back aches, swelling of the legs, pain in the abdomen, or feeling tired. So Again, any of these symptoms, um, some of them on their own may not seem like that big of a deal. So it's really important that um, our patients and ourselves are paying attention to our bodies and just what is abnormal for us um, and having those conversations with understanding. Survivorship. So again, emphasizing uh, the importance of screening, screening on time and screening early is the five-year survival rate for breast cancer detected early is nearly 99%. And again, this is looking at data from 2013 to 2017. Um, but again, the, the earliest that we can diagnose it, uh, the best possible outcomes we can have. So effects on child health, sometimes I get questions about um, cancer treatment, cancer in general, how does that affect uh, maternal and child health, birth, especially when it comes to cervical cancer being a reproductive organ. So it is, research does show that cervical cancer and cancer's um, treatments for those are associated with the increased risk of infertility. 
and other poor outcomes. And some of those include preterm delivery and low birth weight. So um, beyond yourself, there can be some other health uh, complications when we're thinking about fertility. And then um, that's supposed to say <laughs> get vaccinated. So I apologize for those typos. But um, obviously, we're going to recommend uh, populations to go to their provider, their uh, primary care provider, uh, to get screened, to get vaccinated. You can also um, recommend or go to your local health department. Um, in addition, for those that that need uh, to establish have insurance but need to establish a health care provider. Um, the HRSA website and a few others are great to uh, direct people towards. But for those that are uninsured or underinsured, the Indiana Breast and Cervical Cancer Program that is within the uh, Chronic Disease Division at the Indiana Department of Health, those that meet the in income requirements can get free mammograms and pap smears, HGV testing, so free breast and cervical cancer screenings. So I really want to emphasize those. And they have uh, regional providers, regional coordinators. So um, definitely a great resource to connect women with who need to get screening and need resources to do so. Um, I also wanted to highlight the Indiana Immunization Coalition. Um, they they screen or excuse me, they provide HPV vaccinations along with uh, a lot of other vaccines. And um, so I have their website on there. We can share those links after. But um, for, for they also provide free vaccinations for those that are uninsured or underinsured. And while they are located in uh, the Indianapolis area, they have clinics throughout the state. And so they have a mobile unit that can come to different locations, schools, and provide screening, uh, or excuse me, provide vaccine events. So I wanted to highlight that resource as well. Um, in addition to providers and, and healthcare teams, the Immunization Coalition has a continuing education module for HPV that can help, um, help you uh, increase those skills to make a strong recommendation and also additionally can help track and increase your vaccination rates in your practice um, or for just yourself. So a great resource. I believe it's free as well. So I wanted to highlight that. But um, And again, the VFC program or the Vaccines for Children helps families that are eligible who might not otherwise have access to those vaccines. So again, those would be at no cost. And so, again, highlighting ways um, that we can overcome some of these barriers to get bug screened because we know it is not simple and there's a lot of contributing factors. These are just some of the resources um, or sources from some of the data and things I presented today if they weren't didn't appear at the bottom of the screen. And that's all I have for you today. Well, thank you so much, Mary. That was excellent information, um, especially a lot of great resources in there. But I hope people take a moment to check out, um, especially uh, kind of disheartening to see some of those disparities in rural areas and, and surprising to see the men on the rise like that. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe not what would typically be expected in a talk about cervical cancer and, and HPV. So I haven't got any questions yet. The recording again will be on our YouTube channel by the end of the week, and I will be happy to share that link with you once it's up. Um, but just really appreciate all the great information and the time that you've given to us today. Awesome. Thanks. I appreciate it so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions if people have follow up after they watch the recording. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mary. Have a great day. Thank you, too.